before we start this panel, I wanted to say a few words about Ruth Amos, who's going to be the, uh, the uh, moderator for the upcoming panel. And Ruth has obviously seen the whole spectrum of the uh, healthcare system. So she started out a as a nurse, and uh, then she was representing, uh, this is again, we're talking about the American system. So anyone who's acquainted, by the way, does uh, anyone in the audience has had uh, an, an experience with the American medical system? Raise your hand. So those unlucky few. <laughs> I, I also have had a few experiences and having had experiences in Estonia, I think again, we are so lucky here in Estonia, we don't even realize that. <laughs> but Ruth has seen the, the depth of the, um, the American system and she has later been working on uh, different digital healthcare projects in both uh, Kaiser Permanente, which is one of the biggest uh, medical um, systems in the US, as well as Ernst & Young. But I actually wanted to share a slightly more personal story about Ruth. So her grandparents are actually from Estonia. So in 1920s, they get married and decide to go on a honeymoon to the US, but they never return. <laughs> so I guess they must have heard about this upcoming e-residency program that was hailed <laughs> yesterday, that you never have to come to Estonia. So they stayed. And another interesting fact is that Ruth's grandmother is also the sister of the grandfather of Andros Virg, who's running the whole show here. <laughs> But nevertheless, it's your first time on the stage of Latitude, so welcome, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and, uh, and welcome. Thanks for, for coming for all this. I'm going to go ahead and take this. Uh, and we already have the slide up here, so you could see our our guest uh, panel today, and you have already met Nikki, who is our keynote. And uh, please give Nikki a, a warm thank you for, for his uh, keynote. We'll be asking him a few more personal questions about his journey as well. Um, I'd like to uh, bring up our, our next uh, panel. Would uh, Andres Melik please come up? And next we have Toby Moore. Paolo Borella. And last but certainly not least, Kurt Heuler. So everyone, we had met already in the cafe and talked because I wanted everybody to get to know each other. I come from California, and uh, I'll have each panelist introduce themselves about where they're located. But I want to first start out by saying healthcare is special. It's very special and it's very personal. Everyone you know or yourself, 100% of the time, has had some interaction with healthcare. It's unavoidable. It's also quite scary. And I can tell you in the United States, um, it is particularly, we're at a crossroads. Um, and how many of you have had yourself or a loved one interact with the healthcare system within the last six months? Yeah, we have a lot of people, okay. <laughs> so I'm going to um, take some time, we have, an, we have an hour together. I'm gonna to take some time to tell you how I got involved in digital healthcare. And then I'll ask each one of the panelists their personal story as well, because healthcare is personal. And I want you to think about your own personal story and how there are ways in which you as an entrepreneur uh, might be able to help. And sometimes it's not the moonshot. Uh, we love the moonshots. They're big stories. They make a big media news. Sometimes they're very simple things that can make a big difference. So as Eddie told you, I started out as a nurse. And I was taking care of patients, and it was really nice. I got to connect and make a certain difference. And then a lot of new healthcare regulations come in in the United States, and it started to get 
funny. It started to get different. And I noticed a big change in the outlook of the physicians and the nurses and all the extra things we had to do to make sure we were compliant and checking the boxes. And so I decided to go to law school and say, how can I affect regulatory change and legislation and all that? And I wound up actually litigating cases for medical errors. And I got really disillusioned with that because we threw a lot of money after there was a problem. And I thought, well, how can I prevent a problem? So I went back to being a nurse. And I took a big pay cut, but um, it was worth it. And one day, one fateful day, I went to the nurse's lounge, and there was a big flood. One of the plumbing pipes in the operating room had burst and there was just water coming in, like a tsunami, the tsunami that he was talking about. And there were two men from engineering there. I'll never forget the sight. And I stood at the threshold of this room, and water was coming down in torrents. And um, as a plumbing pipe, you might expect, it didn't smell very good either. So one guy had a big bucket, and he was just taking the water like this, and he was pouring the water in the sink where we did our dishes and washed our hands. And that's all he did. He took the water and he poured it in the sink. And there was another guy on the ladder, and he was with a biohazard suit on, and he was up there trying to fix the pipe so that the water would go where it needed to go. Clean water would go to the faucet, uh, dirty water would go to the toilet, and it would be functional. And I walked back in to the unit where I worked, and I looked at my colleague and I said, I know what I need to do with my life. And she looked at me like I was crazy, which was pretty usual. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, I saw this big flood coming down, and that water, that's healthcare data. It's coming at us. The dirty data that we don't need to look at, the clean data, we don't know the difference. How do we know the difference? How, do, how can we find out what's practical? And so I said, the people taking care of the patients, the doctors, the nurses, they're, they're, they're the ones with the bucket. They don't have time to fix this for us. They're trying to keep from drowning. They take the data and they throw it in the sink. They don't know how to make it work for them. Those of us who are brave enough, and, and you do need to be brave, are the ones on the ladder trying to help make this data work for us, trying to make the clean data usable and practical for what we need to do to take care of patients. And then the data we don't need, because we don't need all of it, it's coming at us, but we, we can put that in a place where we may not uh, need to see it. Um, so with that, that's how I got into digital health. Within one month after that, I had all my things packed up. I had moved up to Stanford and started um, helping them deploy their electronic healthcare records and then on, went on to uh, Kaiser Permanente and Ernst & Young from there. But uh, I, I want to tell you why it's so important to have a personal story, because it motivates you. It keeps you going through all the challenges and the regulations. And um, so with that, I'd like to start with our panel. Um, Kurt, please share with us your story about how you got involved into digital health. Thanks, Ruth. So I started as maybe many of you, I, I wanted to, to get an engineer. My father started an engineering company 40 years ago. And therefore, I just took one place where I could, uh, in, could, could study engineering, electrical engineering. So I went to Erlangen. I did my, did my diploma thesis. And um, I listened to a, one lecture of one special person. He was a Siemens manager. Um, Siemens is in Erlangen, so that's where the university was, um, or university still is. And he gave an amazing lecture on medical technology, medical engineering, and computer science and medicine. And um, then I just decided to talk to him, and, and he asked me if I would like to do a PhD in, in computer science. And I told him, I'm an electrical engineer. How could I do a PhD in computer science? But yeah. he told me, as an electrical engineer, um, you are exactly the person that I need for medical technology in my computer science department. Since you know about sensors, you know about um, wiring a person, uh, you know about all the hardware stuff. So I got into his team, and then I recognized in Erlangen, there is not only the, the Siemens healthcare headquarters, there are 26 university hospitals. There are all the big uh, research institutes yeah. like Fraunhofer, Max Planck, um, Helmholtz, all these guys, and they are all focused on healthcare and uh, medical technology. And then I found out that 
100,000 people are living there. There are 40,000 students, 25,000 working for Siemens, 15,000 working in the university hospitals, and all of them were active in that field of healthcare engineering. And then I found out that there is no bachelor or master course on medical technology and healthcare engineering at the university. <laughs> and then we decided that we have to create one. So I just thought by myself out a bachelor and master program, and we just implemented it, and it got the biggest program that the whole university had. So it was, we were attractive uh, for students from all over Germany and all over Europe that came, came to, that, to that bachelor master program. By the way, the Siemens manager is now president of the university. So that grew and grew <laughs> and grew, and <laughs> everyone was focusing on dedicated to healthcare and to medical technology. And then I started um, to think back to my, to my origin. My father was running an engineering company. I always had an entrepreneurial mindset, but now I was uh, director of an institute at the university, and I wanted to get back to that entrepreneurial thinking. I did an MBA. I supported startups among our students, so I tried to, to, to um, fascinate them and to encourage them. I got part of some of these startups um, in healthcare, and then I thought, um, that has to be bigger. That experience that I got there has to grow and grow. And then there was that fascinating um, opportunity where the European Union promised to pay half a billion euro for a consortium that is supporting startups in healthcare. And we thought we, should, we have to be part of it. And um, representing the university and our region, Siemens Healthcare and all these guys, I got part of that consortium. And in the end, in um, December 19th, 2014, we finally won um, the, the bid of the European Commission and got these Amazing. half a billion euro to Amazing. support startups in healthcare. And um, then I changed into the management of, of that organization and now I'm director of business creation at EIT Health. And um, it's my pleasure to support startups um, in that field with vouchers, with trainings, uh, with business plan competitions, with whatever you can imagine. And um, that's our mission to still encourage you to make, to show you how attractive healthcare is. It's a difficult topic, obviously, but if you can do a difference there, if you can put your knowledge into that field and create a new business, a new idea, then you can change the world. Awesome. No, and you know, we, we think it, that you have to be born with this and everybody knows that they're going to be this when they grow up. And, and rarely that's true, correct? It's usually an inspiration Absolutely. from Oh, let's say a lecture at Latitude 59. <laughs> um, but uh, please, uh, Andres, share your story, please, with us. You have yeah. a very personal story. Sure. Um, it's going to be a little bit shorter than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, we, uh, so I'm actually a computer engineer, and I was doing a semiconductor test, and I was at the research term uh, in UC San Diego in 2008 and 9. <clears throat> and around the same time, my parents didn't tell me, but my uncle had died of repetitive stroke. So they, they you know, didn't want to kind of tell me. They only told me uh, after I got back to Estonia. <clears throat> and then um, I was still doing the research. And then around, and we were playing around with some outpatient rehab applications at the time already. And uh, so my previous company had to do with e-learning. Uh, so we had done uh, some changes in, in the e-learning world and sort of digitizing education and everything. And we worked on the first uh, interoperability standard together with the US DOD uh, when I was, uh, I guess, 21, 22. And so I decided to start looking more seriously at uh, healthcare and what can be done. Can I transfer or translate some of those experiences? And uh, so we were kind of playing around on a part time basis uh, amongst other things. And then uh, in 2013, uh, the same thing happened to my uh, grandmother uh, on, a, on my father's side. So I have very bad odds. Uh, so I'm basically creating applications for myself for, you know, <laughs> for in like 30 years, exactly. or maybe hopefully 40 years. Um, yeah. <coughs> and, then, um, mm -hmm. and then we basically made the jump to the US, and uh, one of the things we did there was, essentially you can probably call it the pivot, uh, is that we jumped from the outpatient uh, space to the very, very inpatient early stage mm -hmm. uh, critical care um, uh, domain, and the main reason being that we figured, and it's pretty clear it's the most expensive place in healthcare. So if you can make an impact there on the complications and the cost and the patient recovery pathways, mm -hmm. then that's what we wanted to do. And uh, we've been there ever since, and now essentially coming back to Europe slowly and some other, um, Australia, Singapore, 
UK and Germany, uh, so mostly English-speaking countries. Mm -hmm. But that's my personal story and like the, uh, sh the sh relatively short path in healthcare. No, thank you. <coughs> and and it, uh, many times it starts out with a, an illness within our family. It, it, it touches us personally in mm -hmm. some way. Um, Nikki, what what has been your experience? Yeah, your I, path I'm towards this? I'm working in uh, healthcare already for uh, more than 11 years, but I can show why I. Mm -hmm. I'm working in healthcare. Please, please stand up all, because you know sitting is the new smoking. Please stand up. <laughs> okay. Those of you who know somebody that is suffering from diabetes, could be yourself, your brother, or a mother, father, a family, or friend, please sit down. Okay. Next question. Those of you who know somebody who is suffering from a heart disease, a cardiovascular disease, same question, please sit down. And finally, those of you who know somebody who is suffering from cancer or maybe died from cancer, please sit down. Now look around you. Those of you who are still standing are very lucky, but the majority, it's maybe 90%, is sitting down. And this is exactly why I am in ICT healthcare to make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Toby, no pressure, but please share with me <laughs> <laughs> your story. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> You're leaving us. <laughs> mm. Don't chop it down. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I live in Riga, um, but originally from Australia. And uh, at, at university, I studied biochemistry. And um, I've, I've always been interested in science, and this, this is particularly then life science and um, more about living things. Um, but I, I found I was actually more interested in, in not being a scientist in the lab, but then what's, what's the business story of the life science? And so then, uh, after working in biochemistry for a while, I went to business school in England. And um, after that, then joined a bank in Germany. And, and then another bank in London. And the, the bank in London was uh, an institutional investor into to various uh, venture capital funds. So then it started to get closer to working, um, working on the fund board, for example, and then, and then the fund, fund manager finding interesting companies to invest in and, and then seeing that investment process. And uh, then there was an opportunity to, from, from London to Riga and then to, to work with um, a seed venture firm, Imprimata Capital, which was in London and then expanding to other places in the world, in, including to the Baltics. So then I was on the other side of the table and, and actually investing in the startups themselves, which was much more interesting than investing in funds. So it's, it's now very, very close to, um, in some segments of, of what we invest, it's, it's healthcare, health tech, med tech. Uh, we also invest in fintech and edtech. But, um, the health, health tech, med tech part is then particularly um, interesting for me personally. So it's definitely much more interesting um, than investing in funds than investing in companies because it's really about the people, the people then who have their, their ideas and their stories which then drives them to create something. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's particularly touching for, for health tech because it, it is about making a difference in people's lives. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very clear. Um, to see that, so that's, yes, that's thank you. personally, personally motivating it, it, for me. It matters, and it's very rewarding for those who are brave. I know there's challenges, but uh, we we really appreciate everyone who thinks in in the way that you do. Um, Paolo, please please share with us your story. Yeah, how did I end up being you know CEO of Vertical, that is the leading head accelerator in Northern Europe? Uh, it's actually, to be honest. Uh, most of my life, I tried to be far away from the medical segment and from hospitals. <laughs> and, and actually, I was lucky enough when young uh, to be healthy and you know to do a lot of sports. And so, being at a hospital only once in a while when I had a fracture skiing or things mm -hmm. like that. But I, I think, fundamentally, because life is a journey, and I discovered things through life that made me more and more interested about this segment and and made me feel about bringing there my expertise and helping the society there. Mm -hmm. And then as well as because, you know, like my parents are getting old and I started to see more and more that, you know, I have chronic diseases and, you know, why can't we help and why are not leveraging some of the technology to me popped up obvious as what have been my, you know, expertise or my mm -hmm. experience through life. Uh, 
And then lately I start to get a bit old as well, some aches here and there. So I started to think like, oh, maybe I need to look into that one as well and try to extend my period <laughs> of you know, healthy life. But if I look a little, what were the key things? I think that already when I was uh, um, at the university, I was studying and I was working and, and training a lot. And, and actually, I got frustrated in working in a few startups uh, in, in the Milano area. They're actually brilliant ideas, brilliant people in terms of like creativity and, and being able to glue things together. Mm -hmm. But then they were kind of horrible in the way of scaling them up. So I, I got frustrated on that one, and there was nobody or nothing to teach at that time how to do it on a you know, scalable way. Mm -hmm. There was no, let's say, Steve Blank or things like that one. So I ended up saying, OK, I want to see an experience on a global scale. I ended up working for General Electric in Italy and in the US for three years and learning how you play things and how you set up processes mm -hmm. on a global level and how you drive improvements there and drive changes. And then I, for personal reasons, my ex-wife, I moved to Finland and there was no G, so I switched to what was interesting at the time was mobile. So I ended up working for 13 years for Nokia in more than 10 countries, including five years in Singapore to covering Asia. And there, I got a lot of learnings about uh, mobility, technology, gaming. Mm -hmm. And uh, I continued my journey, ended up in Berlin running a startup for an online community, so dealing with communities and people. And then after that journey, I started to play more and more with startups. And um, I've been asked to run an accelerator for Microsoft with a 21 million fund to develop Windows Phone ecosystem. And at the end of that one, I was like, OK, what's next? And I started to you know, put these bits and pieces together. And then I got my, what are my current partners that started to say, we should do an accelerator on health and well-being. I was like, well, but then it started doing my parents getting more, myself a little. And then I started to say, well, there is an opportunity to help society, gluing competence on doing startups with competence on dealing with corporates or government. Mm -hmm. and helping to bring innovation there. And then where things started to click, and I started to dive deeper, deeper and deeper in that one, and we started to come up with this concept to how to help startups and how to help the society in the health segment. Now, that's, that's fantastic. And, you know, it, because of what Nikki did with the exercise, we can see very obviously that everyone is affected. And, and he wasn't saying who broke their finger, OK? These are, these are very serious things that um, we're talking about here. Cardiac disease, cancer, diabetes. These are things that are life changing and, and very, very impactful to people's quality of life. So um, it's important work. So thank you for, for sharing your stories. Um, I'm going to go to the next uh, slide here, if I may and um, give you a little snapshot of our talking points here. And uh, I, I think, you know, the introduction, why all the attention, I wanted to share a personal story because I want to inspire all of you to think about your personal story. And even if you're not in healthcare or have never even thought about it, there are pathways that lead us there through a personal experience. So even if you're an engineer or you do gaming devices, everything can help healthcare. Every experience that you have, no matter which field or which industry you're currently in, if you have a personal story and you want to impact healthcare, there's an opportunity. Uh, so I do want to talk through, uh, on a product and a funding success level, some of the breakthroughs that have happened. And I'll, I'll try to split the panel here. The two product guys are on the end. We have Andres <laughs> yeah, Melik. I know they just sort of gravitated towards each other uh, from <laughs> Cognos. And of course, our <laughs> keynote, uh, Nikki Hexer from IBM Watson. And um, in, in terms of product successes um, from, from Andres, we'll start with you. Uh, what, what have been your uh, breakthrough moments uh, involving uh, healthcare um, technology? Um, <clears throat> so I think one of the uh, breakthroughs for us is to s actually break through to intensive care units, which is, um, which is where our core patients who are critically ill usually end up in the hospital on day one of the recovery. And what we address is early, early rehabilitation. So not the outpatient stuff, but what can you do from day one uh, with a patient who might not be conscious? Mm -hmm. And um, how do you assess them better? How do you screen for complications better? Uh, but also, how do you involve everybody in the care loop around them 
uh, to extend the amount of therapy they are getting. Uh, so that's, and it's a space that, so we literally broke through to that space because nobody wants to touch it except for those, you know, GEs and Philipses who develop mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, manufacture devices and then they have device dashboards. Yeah. Uh, that's the only kind of clinical analytics uh, stuff mm -hmm. available there. So mm -hmm. that's, I would consider that that is a breakthrough because it took years uh, for us to actually get there yeah. and get the first deals and everything. And It's a huge breakthrough. I yeah. can uh, speak to that because you mentioned being in San Diego and yeah. uh, I worked critical care at UCSD Medical Center, yeah. so <laughs> well, I know what you're dealing with. Yes. They have a slide deck they're circulating, uh, mentioning that they're using our system, but they're not a customer, actually. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how that happened. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, just any any time you are in an environment that's very chaotic and very challenging, yeah. it's hard to break through. So that indeed is a, a wonderful breakthrough, and um, I, I'm sure it's going to help a lot of people. Sure. So um, thank you for that. And, and Nikki, what would you say, I know IBM has done so much, uh, what yes. would you say if you had to name the top three breakthroughs in the last five years? Yeah, in the last five years, uh, of course, uh, the founding of IBM Watson Health, mm -hmm. because as a company that we are focusing on healthcare, okay, and life sciences. Mm -hmm. But the first, uh, the really first breakthrough came with this development of Watson for Oncology after three years being accepted by large hospitals in the world, because this is like a medical device. It's, um, it's not trivial, non-trivial, that you bring this to a doctor and that he is willing to accept this and acknowledge the fact that he is not capable of keeping abreast with his field, as I just explained, you know. And, and now we are seeing all over the world the acceptance of these systems, and that's really a breakthrough that we have this machine, man-machine, doctor-machine interaction really helping uh, patients. Mm -hmm. And then um, this whole business of startups, also leveraging the whole ecosystem of health. So th those of you who are not in that uh, field, it's payers, it's governments, it's medical device producers, it's startups, it's patients, it's everything. And working with all those entities together and, and pulling off uh, big collaborations with large companies and governments, that was also one of the breakthrough moments that people realized we need to do something about healthcare of our citizens because we are living longer, we are growing older, but we have multiple disease in our, during our lifetime, in the end of our lifetime, and that costs a lot of money. And most of the systems in Europe cannot manage that, cannot handle that. So IT, e-health, is a solution, part of the puzzle, and that you are now seeing that, that, that people are uh, realizing that working with us and also with, start with other companies, and that was a great uh, breakthrough moment. Yeah. Thank Another you. Another one. And um, Toby, um, please tell us a little bit about Imprimatur Capital Fund and, and what you've seen in terms of uh, funding breakthroughs, uh, kind of um, which, which areas in digital health seem to attract uh, funding in your world um, the most um, in terms of breakthrough successes. Yes, yeah, so from our, our current fund um, in, in Latvia, which has been going for about uh, six years, so, so investing is almost finished. Um, so we, we have about 30 companies in Latvia, and uh, I guess 10 of them could be health-related health or, or have an application in, in a health-related um, health in industry. Um, they're, they're mostly about software, and uh, with, with increasing uh, size, volumes, complexities of unstructured data, then some of them are about storing, um, storing, uh, retrieving, uh, visualizing, analyzing mm -hmm. that. So in various, various positions in the stack. Um, a, a slightly different one um, is 3D imaging. Uh, we're projecting then some MRI data slices and then reconstructing them onto a series of plates, which then creates a, a 3D image. And, and that's about uh, pre-surgery planning. Mm -hmm. So it, it's to reduce the time that then the, the surgery team needs to spend in theater. Critical. By doing it before. Um, yeah. So reducing the, um, the, uh, the risk of the patient, if the patient's then to be, to be opened up, so reducing that risk and then just reducing in theater time. Mm -hmm by um, making it more real um, with, uh, yeah, that's that sort of augmented reality mm -hmm. like that. So that's an interesting case. So it's, it's complex um, electronics, optics, and software. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and digital imaging um, is one of the, the next 
kind of um, frontiers. I know, Nikki, you touched on that a little bit uh, in your keynote. Um, uh, not only the, the ability to see images in a different way or in a different um, pattern, but also uh, storage and retention of those uh, images um, so that they're not distorted when they're retrieved um, and or archived. Um, thank you. Uh, Paolo, please uh, share with yes. us your thoughts um, from Vertical. Yeah, so I, I think that what, what I find thrilling uh, is actually these opportunities that, that we see more and more of combining, you know, the digital aspect, the software, and then maybe some hardware. And, you know, how does that affect uh, interacting with a human body? Mm -hmm. So apart from sensors and, and wearables and so on, I think that some of the coolest things we've seen and then, you know, we've been analyzing or we've been choosing together with our partners that we work with, like Samsung or with the Helsinki City Hospital, uh, that is a research center. We've seen some interesting cases. For instance, uh, um, we have one, one team that's called, uh, uh, is actually is, is working on uh, uh, insulin delivery, non-invasive. So they use electronics and they mm. use, uh, you know, they work together with Medtronics and in Willili and they help you to deliver insulin uh, for critical Cases. Is it like a transdermal patch, or how does it? Some kind of that kind one, of exactly. Yeah, and yeah. There, a lot is in the electronics and in the software behind that one. And actually, they use AI to predict a little, you know, that they leverage yeah. opportunities there. Gotcha. That one. So you you glue these elements. Yeah. That, that is something beautiful, in my opinion, to to put together. Elegant. So yes. Yeah. And this is a Wonderful. you know Spanish company, Medsense. Then we have um, I don't know another interesting case is where uh, we have one company that they're using artificial intelligence to help to analyze inbound traffic for calls or for arrivals at the hospital, mm -hmm. and then analyze that one and channel to the right uh, type of uh, uh, doctor mm -hmm. or specialist, mm -hmm. rather than having you know, to queue up and go through several steps. You try mm -hmm. to go directly to the most appropriate one, so you reduce the lead time and uh, you reduce the opportunity or increase the opportunity to treat the patients properly. I think That's I great. love these kind of things, and uh, I don't know, we have another interesting case I would say is like, you know, VR, and the opportunity to use that one to educate students at the uh, university mm -hmm. and student and medicine. And you mean by VR, for those of you who are listening to the live and the recorded VR for virtual reality, yes. correct? Yes, okay. exactly, yes. And I think uh, I love this blending of electronic, physical, digital, and then, then you know, impacting us. I'm, I'm really thrilled about this. Yeah. You yeah. know, it, it's interesting that you bring that up because we have we have a mathematician who deals in statistics and is very elegant in that. And then you're, you're bringing up this creative artistic piece. And so I, I want to encourage everybody who says, oh, I'm not a mathematician, but I play music. You're also in the queue for innovation in healthcare, Absolutely. digital. Ab Absolutely. So it takes Absolutely. creativity, it takes logic, it takes everyone at the table to make a difference yeah. in healthcare. Yeah, you see, uh, today there is a, a lot of data science, being people, uh, uh, people being educated as a data scientist, and you think of a data scientist maybe as a mathematician or uh, somebody who is uh, fluent in econometrics, or, mm -hmm. but it, it, it takes also somebody who is creative, who really can appreciate the particular sector this is applied to and can work with the business uh, there. So it, it's, it's both sides of our brain. Absolutely. Uh, really. yeah. Yeah. Um, so Kurt, please share. You, you have a unique perspective, in, in my opinion, in terms of funding because you're, you're dealing with it more in a government. Uh, the government came in. And, and this is unusual, so uh, it's almost unheard of by the United States standard. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm excited to hear about what, what e EIT is and kind of what successes you've seen. I know we've actually had you speaking with uh, the folks from Thunderbeam here and trying to get that connection. Uh, so please share with us uh, what you've seen successes with EIT so far. Sure, thanks. So. Um, EIT Health is, has two different component, components, I would say. The one thing is uh, the money that we get, the, the public uh, funding that we channel through to the startups. And uh, there is an upper limit of 50,000 euros. So no startup gets more than 50,000 euro direct funds um, from us. Um, but that, on the other hand, means that we can serve a lot of startups, um, that there is a, a high number. Right now, we have 100 startups in our virtual accelerator in, in, in the last year. Um, that got funding and support on the other side. The second thing is the network. So we have 150 partners that are basically um, uh, carrying the organization. 
And each of the partners has to pay 75 to 25,000 euro per year just to be a partner of our organization. So um, IBM, for example, is paying 75,000 <laughs> euro just to be part of the game yeah, sure. uh, at EIT Health. Yeah. And that means that we have a direct connection to all of your potential customers, to mm -hmm. all of your um, potential coaches that you always wanted to meet, but um, it's hard to get, to get in touch with all of them. And so I want to share uh, one or two examples with you. Um, we had last year, first time, uh, we started everything last year, and we had there a boot camp where we invited very early stage startups. Most of them, nine out of 10, haven't even been founded. And there was one team, it was a postdoc and a PhD student, and they, they um, had, a, had a great scientific contribution where they, where they found a method to, to glue kind of uh, pharmaceuticals to human antibodies to treat cancer. We just heard that cancer mm -hmm. is uh, one of the major uh, diseases that we have to fight. And a lot of people are working on that field, so mm -hmm. it's not something that is completely new. But um, they had some scientific breakthrough, at least they claimed that, and therefore we accepted them in our boot camp. And we, they never thought about a business plan. They had the IP, but they never thought about a business plan. So we got, gave them four weeks of training, and there are hundreds of programs that give you training how to develop a business plan. But then we had an additional four weeks where we took them to all of our partners. They did a European road trip and they talked to all the pharma companies, uh, the big pharma companies that we have in Europe. And then they recognized that their former business model was not working. So it looked pretty good in theory, but in the real world, it just did not work. And um, they pitched more than 100 times to different partners and they, they always took something new and remodeled it. And then after eight weeks, they got a great business plan. And they uh, took that business plan to apply for governmental funding in Germany. And they got the biggest governmental exist funding ever, 1.3 million, after eight weeks wow. training in our accelerator. Mm, great. So that's yeah, uh, yeah. really an example how wow. scientific people who never thought about creating a startup yeah. can yeah. turn yeah. Into, into great uh, businessmen just using our funding on the one hand, but even more important, the network. Yes. Uh, absolutely. Um, and, and that's really, you know, such a valuable thing because I, I can tell you there's hundreds more stories like that out there that would just be sitting in someone's living room talking among friends or having, uh, looking up IBM Watson Health cocktail recipes <laughs> yeah. trying to drown their sorrows <laughs> because they went to a couple of companies who said no and, and they don't think it's going to go anywhere. So th these kinds of uh, people, uh, th this is so critical to really learn how to connect. We're going to be going over that towards the end of our um, uh, talk here, but if we can show the slide back up on the screen of our talking points, we'll move to the next uh, section. And, you know, I, as much as we've had successes in this field, I, I don't want to um, give you the impression that it's, oh, healthcare is wonderful, it's easy, there's no challenges. There's quite a few challenges, and um, we're going to touch on that for a few minutes. Uh, number one of which is the regulatory and legal hurdles, uh, which, uh, of which I have had <laughs> firsthand experience, and, and I'm sure everybody on the panel can <laughs> attest to uh, at least twice what I can. Uh, but, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, I want to tackle the middle one first, cybersecurity. You know, you probably, how many have read about WannaCry? Yeah, yeah, NHS, um, right here in Europe. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, startups have in any digital space, but especially in healthcare, is cybersecurity. Uh, because of the nature of the data that is shared within healthcare, it's very sensitive. And so protecting that is of paramount importance. And I know that as we go through startups and everybody gets excited about their idea, uh, everybody wants to get it to market, but cybersecurity is being more and more of a focus. And uh, so I'm, I'm just you know, going to have each panelist down the line, if you would, just spend a couple of minutes talking about you know, cybersecurity in your world and kind of uh, what you're doing to, to look at it, um, to ensure that uh, whatever is in your space, whether you're on the product side, uh, protecting the data within your application, sure. or on the funding side, what you're looking for and the kind of questions you're asking when yeah. vetting the startups. Mm -hmm. so. <clears throat> sure, um, so we, we were actually, I think, quite lucky in the beginning that we went to the US and 
HIPAA and PHI and all those concepts were all over the place, so we started uh, focusing on it early. And that's, that's where uh, the Amazons and the uh, Microsoft Azures, so they were addressing the problem as well. Uh, so HIPAA as a standard, it's I think more than 20 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it is an impediment, I think, you know, it's kind of outgrown its purpose and everything. But it's how do you, you know, protect data, uh, both uh, in the silos and that transfer. Uh, but w what we ended up doing is was actually deep, um, kind of de-identifying the, the data on our platform. Mm -hmm. So um, we don't have any of that private or personal health information, uh, you know, identifiable uh, information going through the platform. So if somebody takes the bedside devices that we have, you know, they have no way of connecting it to an actual patient. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty standard approach. Many uh, startups especially are using it. Um, so that you, know, you work with unique identifiers, and, or, or you might work with uh, other service providers that handle the uh, device, uh, I guess, maintenance or device operation, so that if the device walks out of a particular Wi-Fi network, it turns into essentially a paperweight, so that's, mm -hmm. that's very popular. Um, and when playing with our consumer model, which is a speech therapy service, kind of a post-discharge uh, for these patients, then obviously we have a disclaimer that this is not actually a medical service, and then everything is personalized, and you have your name and your, mm -hmm. you know, your personal stuff over there. So, but it is a balance, and uh, and we don't want to be the reason that the hospital gets fined, you know, five yeah. million or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we do our best not to have that data. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, I know Denmark has a law that they need to do this shadow IDs that you mentioned before, yes. mm -hmm. uh, which is which is kind of overkill and crazy, I think, like. But, and uh, the EHR providers are actually using some of that uh, to impede uh, interoperability. Mm -hmm. So they say like, oh, we, we can't be sure, you know, what, what data is in there because we have shadow IDs and all that and stuff. Right. So it's, uh, but it's a complex issue and simple solutions are the best yeah. <laughs> in, in these cases. You know, you're right at the end of the day yeah. and, and also um, not just what is um, safe in a static world, but what, yeah what ensures cybersecurity when connected to networks and when, you know, like you mentioned before, and also the maintenance uh, and upgrades. So, yeah. Nikki, um, in terms yeah. of IBM Watson, what, what have they been looking at in terms of cybersecurity? Yeah, well, okay, I'm working for a company that has grown up with security, mm -hmm. privacy, coming from banks and insurance companies. But with healthcare, it's different. We have to comply with HIPAA, of course. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we have, uh, it's all by design, what mm -hmm. we do. But then coming to Europe, that's a different matter because then, because then we have to comply with different rules, maybe with European mm -hmm. regulations. There is the GDPR next year, the mm -hmm. General uh, Protection uh, Rule for Healthcare. Um, and we are designing now uh, these systems and the software uh, so that we are compliant, of course. Mm -hmm. And what I see with, uh, so we ourselves are adapting to that and yeah, it, it's difficult from country to country to do that, but it, it's of absolute, of paramount importance mm -hmm. that we comply with uh, security and privacy issues, mm -hmm. which are those two different things, by the way. Mm -hmm. Working with the startups, I always encourage them to do security and privacy by design. Start as early as possible. But on the other hand, you should, have, uh, sh you should maintain the freedom just to design something, and most of the time is a kind of functionality Mm -hmm. But you also should be able to address the non-functionals, like security, like scalability, like mm -hmm. performance. All those things will be of importance if you are going to deploy it in the healthcare and life sciences space, because that's the rules of the game there, you know? So mm -hmm. it's both ways. And what you said is absolutely true. Uh, true. I see a lot of healthcare, like hospitals, that uh, there's a radiologist that has a friend who writes software, who knows a startup, and he is creating an app for himself without letting know the, the central ICT of this hospital. And then you get a shadow ICT which exists outside the hospital where patient information, patient data is, yeah, where? Where it is, you don't know, so it's liable. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, as a startup, you should also warn the people you are working with in healthcare that, that they don't do these things, to so be, be aware of that, because don't go into that trap 
it, it's tempting. Sooner or later, you will be, uh, you will be uh, uh, liable it, it, for that. It, it's very tempting because, yeah. you know, if you recall my story with the bucket people, if you're just trying to keep from drowning, you're not necessarily always going to think about this. You just want relief, right? Yes. And so you just take and throw. And, and so you're absolutely right. Education on the part of everyone, uh, the Everybody. provider, the, the developers, yes. everyone, to be mindful that that's not a harmless exactly. thing exactly. Uh, yeah. to do this shadow IT yeah. thing. Yeah. It's very tempting, but it's yeah. it's not harmless. Yeah, yeah. Toby, please share your um, thoughts on that. Um, yeah, so, so I'll give an example. Uh, but Benny Bay, which is uh, one of our companies from, from Latvia, and it's uh, connecting health insurers with healthcare providers. Mm. So it's the, the data platform to automate a lot of the um, process, which in many, uh, in many markets is still very paper-based. Mm -hmm. So it's expensive and, and prone to human error, human error. So automating that. And they, they started in Latvia um, uh, about four years ago, and they, they now cover about 70% of the market in Latvia, so connecting the healthcare insurers with, with doctors and hospitals. And th they always had a plan to go to the US, so went to the US last year. Um, and the, the HIPAA compliance is fine because they, they need then local infrastructure providers for the cloud service and mm -hmm. they're HIPAA compliant already. Um, the, the challenge for them was to go from, from a, known, a known small market like Latvia to an unknown huge market like the US mm -hmm. where every state is different. And so it took about um, 18 months before actually going of, of trips and, and business development to speak with lots of people. And because the market, the, the healthcare market and health insurance market in the US is, is so large, um, it took a lot of time to understand there are lots of intermediaries in mm -hmm. the system. So yes. a small, small country like Estonia or Latvia, you can probably speak with half a dozen people over, over a couple of weeks and then just understand how the system works. Mm -hmm. And in, in going to the US, it took a year and a half of, mm -hmm. of lots of trips, lots of meetings, mm -hmm. lots of um, paying consultants to say, you know, what are the actual rules in Texas compared with, with New York State or oh, California. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's a challenge. So that was, um, yeah, that, that was a challenge mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. sure that once they actually went there and launched that they would be compliant and, and secure. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, Paolo, please share with yeah, us. Yeah, I think that is a, is a cultural thing. I think that everybody is pretty comfortable in dealing with security on the physical world, you know, access cards and so on, mm -hmm. and then, well, uh, bodyguards and, and so on. But I think on the digital world, there is much less knowledge and understanding, mm -hmm. and then in certain, in certain environments, even less than others. So mm -hmm. we do actually quite a lot of uh, grilling of our teams already up front when we do due diligence to understand whether they're taking care of it, whether they're understanding or not. Mm -hmm. And then we do try to help them where needed uh, uh, in the case. I think it's a, it's a you know, very, very important. It's kind of like a precondition to, mm -hmm. to operate, I yeah. would say. And uh, we've got some interesting cases. We have one uh, company portfolio is, is Kino.io. It's actually, by chance, is even actually one of the startup incubated by uh, AIT Digital <laughs> from Italy. <laughs> the colleagues? Yeah, we have actually a lot of cooperations with AIT Digital. Actually, they incubated us as well as Vertical at the very beginning, and we've been doing training for the teams there as well. But with Keynote, basically, they've been working on developing a platform that they can provide compliance uh, and security by design. So that basically, if you build your own service, you can build on top of their own layers so that things are already there in place uh, by design instead of having to build your own engine. That for a startup, especially yeah. at the very beginning, you know, it might mean months and months of uh, development that you can save or, you know, maybe half a million or so mm -hmm. of, of uh, resources that you, you know, right. have to invest and you right. can invest in something more valuable that is building and validating your business. Right, right. Um, Kurt, um, thank you for that. That's very important. By design is key because you don't yeah, want to build it, all yes. your thing only to find out that if you put a security on it, it won't work. By design <laughs> and by culture, I would say. Like, it needs yeah, to be in their mind all the yeah, time. Absolutely. Uh, Kurt, please, please share your thoughts. Yes, yeah, so cyber security is important and even uh, especially data protection of your pr data, data privacy mm -hmm. protection, uh, that's, um, that's obvious. But nevertheless, um, you ma just mentioned the cultural differences. Um, mm -hmm. That's really uh, amazing how fragmented Europe is, actually. So if you, if you look, um, let's take Estonia or Finland, how open people are. So not just the politicians, also people are open to, to uh, try new things and mm -hmm. to, to just um, um, allow technology to, to do new things. 
And um, let's get back to Germany, where I am from. Um, it's, it's horrible. So we just heard <laughs> in the previous uh, <laughs> panel discussion um, that um, it's not only the politicians that do not want to open uh, the legislation for more digital um, data use mm -hmm. um, and electronic healthcare records and so on and so forth. It's the people who are not open to do that. And that's really an issue. Yes. If you as a startup want to enter one of the biggest markets within Europe, um, you really need support. Mm -hmm. And that's, on the other hand, that's something where our network adds importance, since we know, of course, the people who can help you to navigate you through that um, mm -hmm. legislation in the different countries. Yes. So it's, mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of, lot of things where, where we need to change the mindset of the European citizens in all their countries to, mm -hmm. to get on the same level of openness. But uh, until we get there, we have to find ways around that, and therefore you need a network, and therefore you need support. Mm -hmm. and, and people who've been there before, who can tell you, <laughs> hey, before you go to Germany, you might want to <laughs> talk to somebody. Hey, um, once and, you and fix so Germany, please come yeah. to Italy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think where, where nothing can be done, but everything happens, and normally it's a great area, so like, you know, no, we talk you know, about shadow systems. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, uh, yeah um, so please no, do. It, it's very important from one country to the other, other, but I, I do want to touch on a couple of moments um, because we do have large corporation uh, doing healthcare innovation, and then we have startup uh, sitting right next door. And you know, there's some cultural differences there as well. And so I, I'm just going to pose the question, and I won't get into all the controversies between large corporations and startups trying to work in this space. But uh, Nikki, if, if you wanted um, one or two things that you would like startups to know um, from your perspective, working in a large corporate uh, entity, what, what do you think would be valuable if you were to speak with someone you who's mean, doing a startup? Working with us? Or Correct, working yes, with you. Yes. If well, they came to you saying, we want to work with IBM, we have this wonderful yeah, idea. Yeah, that, that's, that's perfectly possible. I, in my keynote, I already alluded to the fact that as a, a website, we are embracing working together with startups. Uh, we are organizing meetups, hackathons, or mm -hmm. whatever you uh, want to take part in. And uh, just do that. Don't be afraid. We are also, um, uh, we started with Watson. We, are, uh, we went through this stage, you know, and we do design thinking. We, do, we make minimal viable product. We do the same as you. We, we act as the same. That, that's the only way we see that innovation can start collaborate and uh, being consistent in your messaging, but uh, yeah, why not uh, come to us and, and leverage the, the things mm -hmm. we have ready for for startups there? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, don't be afraid of us. Awesome. Uh, I would say, and it can, it can be done all over the world. We mm -hmm. all have a, we have a large organization that. Uh, that does that. Yeah. That's great. And, yeah. and Andres, on, on the flip side of it, yeah. if there was something that you would like big corporations to know about someone just starting out to help them understand your perspective better, what would that be? Yeah, so <coughs> we actually started working with Watson when Watson was still kind of a startup, so a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So they were like an yeah. early stage startup in that yeah. sense. And they had, I would say they had the same growing pains than mm -hmm. as, as, as we, you know, we, we have had and you know, thousands of startups have had. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, we were expecting, it was a kind of a partnership and development support and so on. And we were expecting answers like this. You know, sometimes the answer came, sometimes the answer <laughs> didn't come. So... Uh, sometimes you gave the answer. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> you gave the answer. Uh, so yes. that's, that's on, the, uh, on the IBM, on the Watson side. Uh, for us, it's much more important uh, to uh, make sure that the hospitals and health systems, which mm -hmm. are enormous corporations, mm -hmm. uh, also you know work effectively with us, or we work effectively with them. And you know those guys have. Uh, so I you know, last year I spoke to a consultant. I had been touring the U.S. for two years nonstop. Uh, he said, you know, buy my service or consultancy service. I will tell you 37 reason, reasons why hospital won't buy your product. I told him, you know, I already know the 25 reasons at least you know, off the top of my head, so I'm not going <laughs> to pay you anything. Uh, but uh, oh, but that's the kind of um, um, you know space we are in. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the uh, for instance, we went to a well, very well-known hospital, looked at one of their rehab assessment kind of processes, uh, measured it literally with a stopwatch, uh, told them we can do it 92% uh, faster. They said, oh. That's a that's a huge clinical workflow change, even though it wasn't. And they said like, no, no, we, we'll keep doing it on paper, running around and scanning and printing and uploading it to the EHR. Mm -hmm. So you know, 
So that, that's the... It's, it's called the devil you know. Yeah, you get yeah. very comfortable with something even if it's extremely inconvenient because yeah. it's too... Uh, it seems uh, overburdensome to learn something new. Um, let's go where... I know we're up to the five-minute mark, so I want to talk about opportunities in the last big uh, square there on the screen. Um, we, we talked a little bit about next big bets, I think, uh, already. I think at this point I want to just say, let's say I'm one of the people in the audience here and I want to get started. Um, how, do, how do I get connected, Kurt, um, to EIT? I, I live in Estonia, I live in uh, Latvia, um, I'm up in uh, Helsinki, wh wh where do I go? There are two ways. In every region we have, we have one person that is dedicated to get in touch with startups to support them in the application process in their, in their um, development of their startup. Um, mm -hmm. That person would sit in um, Copenhagen or Stockholm for the, for the uh, Scandinavian and Baltic region. Or you can just go on the website and apply uh, for the programs. Um, we have one program that, is, that just fits what we, what we just discussed, um, our business plan competition. It's called Health Catapult, where you can apply. And if you get part of that, and if you get uh, to the semi-final, then you can pitch in front of a lot of investors. And if you get to the final, you will pitch in front of all our members at our annual summit. So that means that you have all the Siemens, GEs, Philips, wow. uh, and mm. IBM, wow. of course, mm. sitting there in a room that is big bigger, even bigger like that. And um, of course, you can, you can get your future customers there. So just um, drop me an email, and I will put you in touch with the person um, that uh, serves you best. Perfect. And Paolo, how, how would someone get involved with Vertical? Oh, how would they sign up Come and talk to me, or <laughs> <laughs> come and visit us. Don't send me email because I'm horrible with those ones. <laughs> but uh, we, you can access our website. I think that you know, we have a, twice a year, we open calls for submissions for choosing the teams for the full batch. And then in, mm -hmm. in some other cases, we do special calls. Like we just finished a project sure. with OP that is the biggest yeah. Finnish bank, yeah. and they have insurance and hospitals. And we were in a big project to help screen teams for them mm -hmm. and do, do cooperation, co-development together with the wow. IBM yeah. and mm -hmm. a few other partners as well. Mm -hmm. So okay. come and talk to us, come to visit wonderful. our site. That's wonderful. Toby, wh when would someone who's contemplating a startup get involved with your organization and how would they do that? Um, so our, our current fund is, uh, is more or less finished, meaning in June and uh, we're wrapping up. So, uh, and then we'll raise a new fund but that's in probably later next year. Mm -hmm. So, so stay tuned, huh? Um, yeah. So, <laughs> unfortunately, I can't say come and come and speak to me, <laughs> or you can come and speak to me. But I'll say, uh, yeah, yeah we're, we're not actively looking for new okay. investments. Uh, that, well, that's good to know, so you won't get 50 emails. Um, uh, <laughs> Nikki, um, what what are your recommendations? Uh, somebody says, I, I I think I can improve Watson Health. But um, should they go through these guys first? And, no, and how does that work? We have a similar construction yeah, yeah. as EIT mm -hmm. that in each of the regions in the Baltic area, the Nordics mm -hmm. in general, we have different people that, mm -hmm. uh, but you can use me as a portal to the wider IBM. That's uh, no problem. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. And um, Andres, what's been yeah. your experience in terms of people coming to you saying, I, hey, I saw your product and I, I want to, mm -hmm. I, I have 50 ways to make it better? <laughs> um, so we do have, uh, we are in a stage where we are already getting inbound kind of leads yeah. uh, from hospitals, which for a healthcare, for a health tech startup, I think is massive. Uh, normally you would be going around like you know, knocking at doors and nobody would answer. Mm -hmm. uh, my suggestion for if you want to go into healthcare would be to really take a um, very realistic long-term approach, uh, you know, as opposed to things like, you know, mobile gaming, which just one day might explode for you as, mm -hmm. a, you know, as a product in a good way. You know, it's not going to happen in health tech. Uh, it's a very progressive, linear uh, growth, especially in the B2B mm -hmm. area. And, you know, it might explode after, you know, like serious growth stage yeah. you know, with uh, 20 existing hospitals as customers, not before that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So take a realistic long-term approach. Nothing will happen in six months. Sales cycles are, you know, up to two years. So you have to you have to consider that. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. I know we have a zero on our time slot, but uh, I'll ask our, our uh, folks: Do we have time for a couple of questions or no? I, unfortunately, we We're don't. Out. Oh. We don't. Right. Oh, okay. Next time. But uh, please, please do. So if you have questions, yeah. come up and talk to us after. Um, Absolutely. And um, we have we have one last thing. If we want, please. 
I'll stand up. Everybody's been sitting for so long. Yeah. And um, do we have our person here for our stretches? Call to action. Oh, oh she's here. Yeah. Come on, everybody. We have a special person because Hi. healthcare is all about action, right? And so we want to introduce Suzanne from Firma Fitness, who's going to lead us in some end of day exercises. So hi, my name is Suzanne, and you've been sitting here for too long. So please join me. Let's make ourselves move and do some easy exercises. Please start with small steps. Great, and now take your shoulders backwards. Really nice, arms to the front, and let's start swimming one arm <laughs> at a time on a dry land. Great, now both arms at the same time. Wow, it's called coordination. Great, one more time, and now relax. Feet at hip width, inhale, raise your arm, and as you exhale, come to the side and make your side as long as possible. Wow, you're looking nice. Come back up. Other arm, inhale, and come back to the other side. Great. Come back up. Inhale, make yourself as tall as possible, and exhale, stay here down, and roll yourself up really, really slowly. And now, arms to the side, arms really, really backwards, so you can feel the long stretch in your chest muscle. Now, say to yourself, I am that powerful. <laughs> and you can give yourself a hug. Aww. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great day.